It began Friday, January 4th at Columbia. We have a tradition of a Chinese lunch, so somewhere in a book I wrote, I give a detail about the menu of this Chinese lunch because Professor Lee is a, uh, an expert on Chinese cuisine, especially uh, Sichuan and Fujian type northern Chinese cooking and that's not terribly relevant. <laughs> uh, while we were there, we were discussing uh, uh, rumors and so on, and uh, the, the results of our uh, colleague, C.S. Wu, who was doing her experiment in Washington, D.C., because she needed very low temperatures to get the cobalts to line up uh, their spins. And uh, she was making interesting progress. That was the idea. I then drove back to Columbia, which is uh, to the laboratory, which is about 30 miles north. It's called Nevis. And I lived near there, so I stopped for a quick dinner. And on the way, driving, uh, I kept thinking about the report that maybe the decay of cobalt 60 was doing something very interesting. So somewhere around that evening, I had the idea that we could do the same experiment uh, at the Columbia Laboratory because we make pions and we already had one student who was doing his thesis research with pions. Okay. If parity is violated in the pi mu decay, the muons will be born with their spins all in the direction of their motion and the beam will be swept out of the accelerator and into the laboratory we will have a big beam of muons all spinning in the same direction. Well, that's crucial because then we can look at the, where the electrons are coming. Are they coming out in the direction of the spin? Equal numbers in the direction and opposite, distributed uniformly. What will the distribution be? At that point, I got a call from a colleague, Richard Garwin, who actually works at IBM but hangs around Fermilab. And uh, I invited him to... Uh, join us because I said that evening I think I can take the student's experiment, that was Marcel, he's working on his PhD but with a few rearrangements of his apparatus uh, we could test this experiment. So he uh, drove over and uh, we started to rearrange Marcel's experiment. Marcel wants to get a PhD, he doesn't care about parity. So he started crying. <laughs> uh, but we, uh, we calmed him down a little bit. And then uh, we began to think about how to do the experiment. So here's a picture maybe I can give you. The accelerator is back here, sort of a big thing. Uh, the protons smash into a target just at the edge of the magnetic field. Out come the pions. And while they're going through a 10-foot thick a uh, concrete wall that protects the laboratory from the radiation and the accelerator, uh, uh, a big fraction of them decay into muons, and then we, we put in a piece of carbon that stops the pions and the muons stop in this block, and we have counters that tell us that this is happening. We arrange these counters, we have to uh, take apart pretty much a lot of what Marcel did, and every time we did he would cry some more, you know. Uh, okay, so now we have a block of uh, carbon with uh, where the muons stop. And now we want to find out uh, where the electrons go. Well, we had some counters. Let me uh, try to show this a little bit better. Maybe, yes. Okay, here's actually the, the uh, apparatus as we worked it out. The pion beam came in here. The total number of counters in the experiment was four counters. That's all we needed. Uh, the, the protons would stop in this block of carbon. We put this block of carbon into a lucite cylinder and wrapped some wire around the cylinder. And so instead of moving the counters to find out, see, we know, we know that the spins are now lined up in this carbon, they're all pointing, let's say, uh, in this direction, towards you. And now we're looking for electrons, and so we take these electron the telescope, it's called, and move it around. 
except that Garwin had a better idea. He said, don't move this heavy stuff around. Let's just put a magnetic field around the muons, and the muons being magnetic would precess, would turn in the magnetic field. So the muons would change their directions, and we could watch the counting rate here change as the muons, uh, elect uh, as the electrons, if there were a lot of electrons coming out in the direction of the spin, when they illuminated these counters, the counting rate would be high, and when they went in the other direction, the counting rate would be low. So everything depended on turning on this magnetic field and watching the counting rate change. Simple experiment. And uh, by midnight, I think we had everything ready to go. Well, yeah, I think it was Saturday morning. This was Friday night, so Saturday morning, all the counters were working. That was easy. We already had four counters. Everything seemed to be behaving right, and then we started to see a change in counting rate as the electrons, uh, as the muons were turning. By 4 a.m., the effect started to go away, and when they turned off the accelerator at 9 a.m. for maintenance, uh, there was no, no noticeable effect, even though we were very excited. Uh, so Saturday morning, when they turned off the accelerator, we pleaded with them to let us run for another few hours, but they refused. <clears throat> Bang, bad guys. We went down into the cyclotron to see what happened, and we found that the lucite cylinder in which we had jammed a piece of carbon and had round them, put the wires around the lucite, the lucite melted. Because the wires were hot, and the carbon fell down. And all of a sudden, our spirits increased because something we had slopped up the way we arranged the experiment. So we spent the weekend, there was all the time intervals, repairing the stuff, making a better system, wrapping the wire directly on the carbon, uh, taking turns going to sleep, uh, and, uh, and then starting the experiment again. Uh, let's see, here it goes. We're at midnight. The data taking resumed. I went home to sleep at 3 a.m. Marcel was sleeping already, uh, still crying. <laughs> oh, we started crying when we saw the apparatus. All of us were crying. And at uh, 6.30 a.m., I get a telephone call, even though I only have three hours sleep. Darwin called and said, you better come into the lab. We've got a 22 standard deviation effect. So here's, here's the, here's, well, here's a picture that tries to make this a little clearer. Here's the muon sitting there, and a spray of electrons. That means there's a lot of muons. Every muon gives only one electron, but you're doing this over and over again. And so you get a counting rate, let's say, of, at this direction, but this muon is turning in our magnetic field. So at some time, t equals zero, five counts per second. Then a little bit later, the full blast of electrons is coming, 12 counts a second. You see, because I've taken an, a case in which most of the electrons are coming off in the direction of the spin. It's the asymmetry, the electrons going this way versus this way, that determines the asymmetry. And so you see a counting rate change as the muon turns around. If there were symmetry, electrons equal numbers here, you would see no change in the counting rate. So here's the data after uh, uh, some six or eight hours of data taking. If parity were conserved, if mirror symmetry were valid, all these points would be the same. Instead, we have this perfect example of a spin rotating and giving us more electrons, less electrons, more electrons, less electrons. So, by Saturday, by Tuesday, this was now Tuesday morning, we had uh, made a major, major discovery, namely that mirror symmetry was not valid. 